Let's just ask the Lord to cover us. Father, we thank you for what you've already done for us. Now, Lord, plant some seeds and sow some seeds, water some seeds, harvest some seeds, multiply seeds this morning, Father. Help us to get that understanding, Lord, of who you are and what you do. And we thank you for it, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. I sent you out a note telling you that we were going to explore the perpetuating seed dynamic. The perpetuating seed dynamic. And as I've been uh, diving deep into the prepare the way anointing, I'm discovering some mysteries and truths that are beyond just that, but helping me to understand why this revelation, why this anointing, why this move of God is bursting forth from the earth now. And, uh, and then I'm beginning to understand more about the whole dynamic of the Lord planting seeds from before the beginning of time. I'd like to take us back to, we, we, we touched on it and brushed on it last week, but I really didn't give it the credence it should have. And I want this to sink deep into us because I know that the Holy Spirit's gonna help you to, to find these truths in yourselves. And, and not only that, but gonna help you to cultivate seeds that God has already planted in you from before the beginning of time. And then you realize that you're part of that farming system with God. He really wants you to farm with him. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever worked on a farm. You could put your hand up. Or maybe if it wasn't a farm, maybe you just had a garden and you grew some special tomatoes, some organic stuff. You know, um, when I worked on the farm, there wasn't even a, 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 a contrast between what was organic and not organic. Everything was organic. And uh, we didn't know the difference. I will have to tell you that everything contributed to what we did on the farm. And some of you who are still farming in some ways, you understand, you learn how to use what you have on the farm, right? And you learn how to use it for something else. Well, we had some livestock, not much. We had some sheep and uh, we had some horses and uh, we had some chickens and ducks and uh, for a short time, the goat, until the goat ate Grammy's bloomies, then the goat was gone. But, and nothing went to waste. You know, my namesake, my grandfather, uh, Frank Franco, he, Fiorino Franco, he, he came, obviously, from the old country, and he utilized everything that was on the farm, as did in the farmhouse. And, you know, when it came time to enrich that which we were growing, Myself, one of my jobs, daily jobs, was to go into where the manure is, right? And he would mix it with water like a week beforehand. And so there'd be this big vat of manure water. And you know, as a young kid, six, seven, eight, nine years old, it was like, oh man, I'm doing this. And we would put pails in it. And when I could, it was easier to carry two pails in one, right? Because one sloshes around and not good stuff to get sloshed in. So it was, I learned early on and it made me work to carry two pails as a young kid. Now most of you know that, you know, a gallon of water weighs eight pounds. A gallon of manure water weighs about 10 or 11 pounds. And so, you know, I'd take one pail and another pail and there I am like this and we would take it to the plants and pour it along the bottom of the plants. And that was the nutrition for the plants. And I didn't mean to do it, but I did it because there were certain plants that were farther away than other plants, so I cheated. And I would take the manure up to these plants and then just pretend I went to those plants so I wouldn't have to carry 60 pounds of pails or 70 pounds of pails as a little kid up to those plants. Well, somebody's smiling because you already know what happened. I got caught because these plants grew better than those plants. And I realized after that one cycle why we did that. I realized that there was something inherent in that fertilizing that we were doing that was helping those plants, those seeds to grow faster. Now, my grandfather wasn't a scientific farmer. We didn't know about changing the crops we grew the crops in the same place as they were, and they grew. 
and uh, out of it came most of the stuff that, that, that he would eat, and then of course we'd get the benefit, our houses were next door, you'd get lettuce, you get cucumbers, you get tomatoes, you get uh, the, the squash, zucchini, peppers, uh, corn, you know, enough that it, was, it really was useful for us and it grew. And without realizing how the Lord was using that in my life, and especially now with this fresh revelation of seeds, I realized that certain plants came up and started to sprout sooner than other plants. And they had cycles. And then I realized that, you know, they obviously took their identities and some would grow like this, the corn, and the others would grow like this. I also realized that most of you probably have too, that the beasts of the field have their favorite vegetables that they want to steal from you. And those stinking rabbits, they were like, you know, they were all over it. Anything green coming up, that rabbit was on it. But interestingly enough, the rabbit didn't mess with the corn. The deer messed with the corn. And so there's, within the power of the seed, there's specific functions and systems and processes in this symbiotic process that God has created here on earth. I want to go back to Genesis. We dealt with this somewhat. And in Genesis, in creation, we dealt with last week that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was out form, and we realized that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. That is the first revelation we have of how God creates. The Spirit moves. God speaks, the Spirit moves. And you'll find that to be fundamental throughout all of Scripture, the Spirit moves. Well, I'm going to bounce back and forth about the Spirit moving in you. You see, we're going to discover and uncover, you have seeds that have been planted from before the beginning of time, and the Spirit is hovering, and, and it's brooding over you, just like the beginning of the earth. And guess what? It's the same force, the same power, and the same love of God moving to bring forth that which has been already impregnated in you in seeds from the beginning of time, the same awesome wonder of how he created the earth. That's how wonderful and mysterious and amazing his creation, his new creation is in you. It's the same way. And we, we go through this rather quickly. It says the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and God said, let there be light and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness and God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And so God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament and it was so. We understand that God was putting some elements in place to be able to sustain life not only to get to the sixth day with human species, man and, and, and woman, female species, but God also was, was preparing what needed to be to sustain everything he was about to create. But there was something that, that we have to take notice of in this, because remember, this is spoken of in generalities, and then as we go on in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, we get some more specifics about God's creation. God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear, and so it was. So now God created what we would understand to be oceans and to be land. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together and the dry land appeared. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters called the seas and God saw that it was good. We mused last week that we understand what God gives himself an attaboy for. Good creation, good creation. What pleases our father and what he himself calls himself good at is creation, creation. And uh, we know further on in the sixth day we get, let us make man, let him make him in our image and our likeness. And that image and likeness was intended to be very good in the image and likeness of God, but we know it got perverted and it got sub subjected to sin. 
But in this instance, we're going to deal mostly with the seed right now because the seed's in everything. And God said, let the earth bring forth the grass. In verse 11, and the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after their kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself and his kind. And God saw that it was good. God has blessed seed. God created seed so that seed could multiply and procreate. And that seed is from the beginning of time. So we understand that one of the fundamental elements of the creator that he says is good is creating seed. And that seed is already identified to bring forth the same kind of seed that it already is. Now, I'm not gonna give you a deep dive into uh, the, the uh, uh, science of seed, but we are gonna go a little bit into it because you'll begin to understand how that seed is the same and works as the Lord says later, and even as Jesus gave us in parables about planting seed, cultivating seed, harvesting seed. In this instance, what I'd like you to do is to see that the Spirit of God, when he said, let there be the herbs and the fruits that yield themselves, whose seed is in itself according to its kind, when God spoke it and declared it, the Holy Spirit was still working and brooding. And so we get an inkling about how God works, the three persons of God. Now we know because of the revelation of the Pauline epistles that by him everything was created, without him there was nothing that wasn't created, that's Jesus Christ. But we also know that Jesus said the Father is greater than I, but yet he and the Father we understand are the same. This is a mystery we don't quite get, but we, we take this forward and we get to the, to, to the resurrection source. Because, and, and just put that aside for a moment, because a seed must die into the ground in order for it to come back alive. And Jesus, the first fruit, he died into the ground. He died in sin, and he descended, and then he resurrected. You see, there are some that have taught, and erroneously so, that when Jesus said unto you, Father, I commend my spirit, that he went right to heaven, that he didn't descend into hell. Can't be because then he didn't die. And if he didn't die, then the seed can't come alive. And if the seed can't come alive, then resurrection life means nothing to you and I. This is fundamental. This is understanding that Jesus indeed died in sin. The soul that sins must die. That's the word of God. And there's only one place for sin, and that's not in heaven. How many of you know there's no sin in heaven? Hmm? How many of you know that at that pearly gate, if you need a good bath, you're gonna get one before you get into heaven? How many of you know that, you know, the soul that dies, that sins, must die? And so all of our soulful, sinful souls died with Christ from the beginning of time to the end of time. And in that seed, in that seed of Christ, it died and went into the ground and descended. So, and Paul made it very clear, who is he that ascended, but that he first descended. Because he was probably dealing with the same thing. He probably had people say, wait, I heard him say on the cross, you know, I give my spirit to the Lord. Well, we give our spirit to the Lord too, don't we? And, and we do that when we are baptized. We're baptized with him into death and, and we're resurrected with him into life. That's what the newborn uh, relationship is. It's a symbiotic relationship. So the Holy Spirit's brooding. You have seed within the seed. And then the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after its kind. And and tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself. In itself. Say, in myself. You have seed in yourself. And you bring forth your kind of seed. And that goes to creation and procreation, doesn't it? Man and woman bring forth the seed. Not man and man, not woman and woman. Not genders of whatever people think they are. It's each kind bring forth its seed. This is a fundamental law of God. So we can understand why God didn't treat it very well when we had issues with sexual issues going on in the old covenant. Because what it does is it, it perverts and it goes against the very law of creation of God 
And what did God say about every kind bringing forth its own kind in the seed? It is good. God qualified it. That is good. Now, the opposite of that is bad. Good, bad. And so we understand God can accept bad. God accepts good. And so it gives us hope because every family, somebody has somebody who's trying to find their path with their sexuality. Don't tell me you don't. Maybe you just haven't gone back and forth in your family enough. Everybody has somebody. But now you know how to pray. And you know to call forth that seed. Call that seed that God gave because it's, it's just a, a seed that's been a little bit fermented. It got off track somehow, some way, but the seed is still there. The seed is still in the identity of the person that God brought forth from before the beginning of time. It's that seed. And something about seed, he says, let every kind bring forth its own kind. And we see that he, he, he concludes that and, and keeps going forth with everything that he creates, animals, birds, human beings. Every species, every kind is bringing forth its own kind. That's why if you understand that and accept that in faith, it's impossible to believe the evolution of, 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 of man, which is the species, both male and female, having come from something that had a different seed. It can't happen. It's impossible. I've shared with you before that you know, Jesus said that he would separate the goats and the sheep at the day of judgment. And that's believers. That's not unbelievers. Believers already have a different, unbelievers have a different judgment. This is believers. These are those that say they're of Christ, but aren't walking in Christ. And the unenlightened mind about the seed, which would be the DNA of a, of a goat and a sheep, is they're the same, but they're not. They're not. The sheep is 54 chromosomes, and the goat is 60. 54 plus 6 equals what is six? Flesh? Some flesh with the spirit becomes a goat. What happens to the goat? Get out of here. Depart to my left side. Sheep enter to my right side. So the seed is very important. And we understand that, you know, we're understanding more now about genetic seed. We're calling it DNA. But it's seed. And God patterned everything according to that seed, that DNA, and said, repeat and bring forth your own kind. Bring forth your own kind. And so when we're trying scientifically to crossbreed a lot of stuff, most of the time, if you try to crossbreed a goat with a sheep, you get a stillborn. It dies. And it doesn't come out a sheep or whatever they were trying to make. It dies because it's supposed to bring forth its own kind. And in this instance, let's start to relevate this to spirit. One other interesting point we talked about last week, and the evening and the morning was third day. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Now, that's not a contradiction of what he did back in verse 4. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. What he was doing was after he said, let there be seed, he had already coded into the seed a process. It's a five-stage process that brings forth a seed. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more right now. I have a, a graph that I asked uh, Dwayne to get up for me if we could get that. And this is the parts of a seed. Look at the outside called the seed coat. Look at the, the little green aperture that's coming out, which is called the embryo. And look at the place called the stored food. Now, if you want to do your own deep dive on the seed, there's many more scientific names for all of these things. And they break it down into a lot more than this basic three parts that I'm presenting because I want to keep it simple. But the seed consists of these important parts that contribute to its plant growth and its reproduction. Reproduction, another way of saying multiplication. 
Let every kind bring forth its own kind. Multiply, the Lord says, and fill the earth and take dominion to man. Everything has its own process to occupy and to multiply. And we see that the seed is composed, first of all, of the seed coat, and then you have the embryo, and then you have something called the endosperm that's called stored food. Now the seed coat provides protection. And if you'll please go now to what I've drawn here, if you could bring that up, I wanna be able to deal with this a little bit. Not too bad, I did all right. And so, first of all, you already know this is the seed coat, right? Now, very interesting that science has determined to give us a graph of a seed that looks like a what? A baby in the womb, right? Looks like a baby in the womb. That's how seed looks on the inside when you take it out. It's, it's the raw element of a seed, which is the seed of life, human life. And the seed coat is very strong. The seed coat it has two layers, and it has an outer layer and an inner layer. For those of you who are interested, the inner layer is called the testa, and the, and the, inner, uh, the outer layer, the testa, and the inner layer, the tegment. The testa is rough and protective. See how it is? It's rough. This, this, this layer is, it's tough. And it's tough to protect the seed. And the inner layer is soft. And it's soft so that it's thin and allows something delicate as a protective covering over what is the embryo. So as you get to this embryo, it gets soft. Hard on the outside, soft on the inside. Remember I've told you that as God continues to mature us, and I pray this way for myself, that he gives me very tough outer skin, that I could absorb and deflect a lot of what comes at me from the world, from the enemy, from Christians, from anybody. Soft skin, I mean tough skin, but on the inside soft so that we realize that we're vulnerable. As believers in Christ, we're vulnerable. And when we're working in grace and with the soft skin, we're gonna take some hits. And in that, we have to learn how to translate that. How do we respond to that? How do we communicate that? We don't communicate it in the flesh, in the outer skin. We communicate it from the inner skin with grace. And that grace, is protected by the outer skin. And so we see here, as God started with the earliest part of his creation that brought forth life, the seed. The seed that this continued and magnified even as he multiplied it through all of the different things he created. First starting with seed, then the birds of the fowl, the fowls of the earth, and then the, the walking creatures and the creatures of the earth, and finally unto man both male and female, he created them. So we see the, the embryo, and the embryo has tissues in it. Now, the tissues give rise to a root, so out of that seed for the root comes out of that embryo. That's why we wanna be planted in the right water spiritually, because that root will draw upon the soil that it's planted into. It's made to do that. Your spirit is made to draw upon the soil that it's planted into. If it's good soil, you're gonna draw goodness and the Lord's gonna say good. If it's bad soil, you're gonna draw badness and it's not acceptable. Now, we'll get into Romans 8, but the Lord says there's an Abba spirit in all of us crying out, Abba, Daddy, to be, be incorporated back into the kingdom of God so that the embryo, our spiritual embryo, is drawing from the living waters and the Spirit of God. <clears throat> and this embryo is what needs to be protected. 
And from it come the root, the stem, and then the leaves of the new plant. And that's why you see this little aperture right here sticking out because it's beginning to reach beyond what it's contained in. It's reaching beyond. It's beginning to produce fruit. The Lord says we know a tree, that's us, human beings, by the fruit that we produce. By the fruit that I produce and you produce, we know where, what waters we're drawn from. We know what soil we're drawing from. And so we need to be very cognizant, even in what we think is the safety of a Christian environment, we don't want to ignore things we hear, see, and discern that might indicate that somebody's drawn from some bad waters. And we'll get into this also as we talk about the prepare the way anointing about atmosphere and changing atmospheres and how when God gives an anointing, it also changes atmospheres, but it can be tainted by an atmosphere. Right? And so in that instance, let, you know, let me just give you a little, little foreword on that so you can begin to let it dwell in your mind and in your soul. You know, John the Baptist and Jesus crossed over, right? There was a threshold. John had to decrease, Jesus increased. John, who was baptizing but not in the Spirit of God, Jesus came in the Spirit of God. And he was baptizing in the Spirit of God. He was the one who could do that. John couldn't. And in that instance, <clears throat> John's disciples, some of them persisted beyond Jesus' resurrection. And Paul came upon some of them, didn't he? And they hadn't even heard about the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were still disciples of John the Baptist. And they were sort of stuck in, in that page because they were in that atmosphere, and that atmosphere had enveloped them. And so even though there was another atmosphere operating in the earth, they had no clue about it because they had not yet crossed that threshold. It's the same today. There's a whole bunch of people that the vast majority of those who love God and are believers in one source or another have no idea of the atmosphere that's going across the earth right now. More, more likely to be lured by some of the teachings that are coming on about end times. You know, everybody wants to give me more about the end times as if they're gonna learn something they haven't heard already that just gets regurgitated by somebody else a different way. They're gonna grasp back on to the rapture so we can get out of all this chaos and darkness and not have to worry about it. They're gonna look at politics different. They're gonna look at you know, everything differently because of the lens that they're looking through because of what they're breathing in the atmosphere. And so the atmosphere is very important. And that's why the Lord, after he created the seed, and we already had the light and the darkness, he said, wait a minute, we need to make this so that it has seasons and it has, and it has a time element in it between the darkness and the light. So he created the firmament in the heaven. And that means the sun and everything in it and the moon for here. And if you know about the sun and the moon, that's how we get day and night. We revolve, right? Now, was the earth moving before that? I have no clue. But it didn't really need to until God said that. And once God said that, the Holy Spirit moved, and everything went into perfect science syncopation. The motions of the earth so that we don't fly off and fall down, gravity coming down as a law, everything spoken into at that moment. Interesting that after he did that, that was after he said, let there be seed. So he realized and knew when he created it that the seed, some seed requires light and moisture. Do you know there's seed that doesn't require light? It grows in the dark. And so if there's seed that grows in the dark, God took care of both of them. But what we find out is the seed that grows in the light is that which most likely produces the kind of things we want to eat and that we need. That's that fruitful seed. So God, after he planted the seed, then he said, now we need to have a process for this seed to grow and to be sustained and to be able to multiply, to reproduce. And it's the same with you and I. 
you had a seed planted in you from before the beginning of time. And that seed has your name on it. And in that seed is all of the coding that is you that is nobody else. Nobody has what you have. Only God could do that. Nobody has what you have. You're unique. And it has to do a lot with what soil you've been planted in, what soil you found your way to. We all did, right? The Word is, is, is cultivating and feeding us. And it's the atmosphere. What atmosphere are we in? There are some people who choose not to be in a challenging atmosphere. They just want a comfort level in the kingdom of God. And so they take comfort pills. There are other people who say, I want everything that God has. I'm passionate and I realize it's radical and I'm daring, but you know what? I've got the, the, the seed coat and the embryo soft, so let me deflect what isn't of God and let me ingest what is of God and let that stay. And so God created that atmosphere in order to grow the seed and to have the seed multiply. Now he's done the same thing for you and I. He did it in a big way when we got the light of Jesus Christ. That was a major, major resurrection. It's called new birth in our life. It's new birth in our life. How many of you know that the seed that has within itself the seed, the fruit, every time there's a new tree, that's a new birth for that seed. Every time that fruit comes down and has multiple seeds and plants in the ground, there's multiple new births. Let every kind bring forth its own kind. That's why you're so important right now for the prepare the way anointing because you've been coded and seeded for it. And from the moment that I found out that Jesus was Lord, that got activated in me. I mean, it was like the same day. And I was a little confused because as I went out finally after almost a year of not fellowshipping with, with believers, as I went out, I didn't see that same passion in people to prepare the way. In fact, I saw what I would call the opposite of that, to escape the way. Everybody was more excited about escaping the way. I remember the first time I got my television back on because I didn't have electricity or water or anything for a long time. I was weird. And didn't have any money, I didn't have anything. I got my television back on and I was watching, I wanted to see something Christian and so I got, I got CBN and, and, and I'm watching it and Jimmy Swagger comes on. Well, I didn't even know who he was. And he has this big chart that went across the wall in the back and in it, it had the whole rapture eschatology. I, I didn't know what it was. And he started off with, you know, this is the pre-trib and this goes this and when this happens, this happens and then this happens and then this happens. And I was like shaking my head. I said, where's the prepare the way at? I didn't see it. it wasn't there. Nothing about preparing the way. It was about escaping the way. And so Christianity got sent side and the embryo was drawn from the wrong soils. And some people were still trying to, to, to water those soils with the wrong message. Can you imagine if John the Baptist with his calling to prepare the way of the Lord out in the wilderness, if he went out in the wilderness and he said, hey, forget about preparing the way, we're gonna hunt. Have all the men come, we're gonna get drunk and hunt. Or, or what if he just said, you know what, let's just, let's just believe the Messiah is coming and he's just gonna take us all away right now. He didn't preach that message, although there were those Jews living in that day, their expectation was for the Messiah to come as a mighty warrior and to deliver the Jewish people from the Romans and to give them a king on the throne of Jerusalem because of the promise that God made to David. That was predominant in that day. But he had a different message, prepare the way. He wasn't even sure what prepare the way was, but he knew it was the anointing for the time. He knew it was the atmosphere and it had a magnet. And we'll get into the magnet more. 
Every kingdom shift has a, a magnet. For those of you who want to get ahead of me, I'll give you something else you can look at. And I did a whole series on it. The call to Ziklag. When the shift of the kingdom was going from Saul to David, the Davidic kingdom, David was out in the wilderness. And they came to him day and night. And they added to him until it was a deep army committed to him. Only God could do that in order for him to take the kingdom over and call it the Davidic kingdom upon which the throne of Jesus will never leave. It's a magnet. It's the atmosphere. But it all comes back to the seed. And in this parts of the seed, you have the seed coat, the embryo, and the endosperm. The seed coat protects it. And it also helps it to go to new places. It helps it to go to the place of next. For those of you who lived through that with us. And how many of you know that just recently, and, 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 and actually more than that, they found seeds that were in pyramids. They found seeds that were in tombs, even in Jerusalem. And they planted those seeds. And the type of seed it was produced its identity. It was kept dormant all those years, a couple thousand years and more. That's why there's a seed in you that's dormant from, oh, because she, I feel the Holy Spirit. From the beginning of time, unique to you. And, you know, we all, because of who we are and because our spirit is being brooded over by the Holy Spirit, we feel the tug. We feel the tug that we're supposed to do something else. That we've been made for greatness, for something. And we watch the world which exalts the greatness from bad seed. Seed that doesn't sing psalms and praises to God with tremendous gifts and music and, 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 and all of the technology and instruments, but instead sings praises to that which exalts anything but God. And then the artist becomes the God instead of God. And we feel inside of us this tug. And some of us get restless. We want to run here and run there to see if there's somewhere that our seed can find its identity and prosper. When the Lord says, those who wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. And the Lord says we will do great exploits in these days. You see, I'm firmly convinced that some of you, some of us, we'll find our way to paths. In some of our instances, that which God has called us to do may not have a long fuse on it. It might be a short one, but it'll be powerful. And in that instance, you know, there's a program out there done by a lady that's a good friend of Laura Lee and I, we love her dearly, called Better Together. We are better together. We're better together. I'm better with you. You have to decide if you're better with me. I choose to be better with you. And I choose to be better with people <laughs> of the same kind. Because every kind brings forth its own kind. And I don't want to be in the wrong atmosphere. I don't want to be drawing polluted waters from a bad soil. I don't want somebody that I, have to, that I have to contest with for the truth of God because they have a different message. They have a different vision. What brings forth the activation of that seed? First of all, it's the Word of God. Now that's after the Spirit of God has moved, right? That's after the Spirit of God has moved. No matter how you think you received Jesus, the Spirit of God was brooding. And that, that gives us hope for wayward children, wayward friends, wayward spouses. The Spirit of God is brooding, brooding. It's by the Spirit. Many times I've prayed, Holy Spirit, go after Him. Go get Him, capture Him just like you did Paul, just like you did me. Go get them. 
Holy Spirit, hunt them down like a dog. Find them. Begin to brood over them, brood over their sleep. Send messengers just out of the clear blue. Send somebody at the, at the gas pump. Send somebody, send dreams. Change friends that come back and tell the news. Holy Spirit brooding. But then it's the Word of God. The Word of God waters the Spirit, the seed that's inside of us. And every time we grasp a new truth in the Word of God, something clicks in that seed. <laughs> and all of a sudden, we become so excited because it's like the light went on. It's like, click. Ah. And especially when we need rescued. You know, we don't think we're going to make it another day. Hey, I've been there. How many of you have been there? Huh? I've been there. I've been there where I prayed the Lord to take me. I didn't want to live another day, and I didn't, knew enough not to try to take myself, but I didn't want to be there one more day, not even an hour. I've been there. I've been there where I couldn't sleep, and, and drops of sweat were dropping off of my head. My mind was, was a myriad of confusion and fear. I've been there. But then, when I got the revelation of Jehovah Gael, the rescuer. And I realized that it's in that moment that seed clicked. And I came into relationship with Jehovah Gael, the rescuer, the deliverer. In that moment, he was with me. And the Holy Spirit brooded over. And all of a sudden, a peace came in. Not a peace because my problem had been solved. A peace because the seed had been activated. And all of a sudden, that problem was dim. And the word cultivated the seed inside of me that cries out, as Paul said in Romans, Abba, Daddy. He says the whole earth is groaning and crying out in that voice. How could that happen unless it's a seed? You and I have had people tell us they don't want to hear anything about the Lord. I don't know about you, but the first thing I experienced when I found Jesus, I lost everybody. I lost my family, lost my friends, lost my jobs, lost my work. I lost everything. And that I didn't lose, I gave away. That's why I was in a home without electricity, without water. Just me and the Lord. It was one of the best times of my life. Not at the moment. <laughs> but I look back on it, and he was activating the seed. He was showing me and telling me things that were to come and have now come and are coming and coming. And I couldn't understand it, and I didn't get it, and I was confused why everybody else wasn't getting that same seed activation. And you're probably the same way. But it's coming. And the Holy Spirit's brooding over you. And he's bringing it forth. And that embryo that's inside of you is reaching out to multiply. I remember in the midst of all of that, my mother's cousin, Dom Milladona, I don't know how many of you knew Dom. I told my mom, I, the Lord told me I needed to be anointed by somebody and prayed over to activate inside of me things he had. I didn't use the word activate. I said to bring to life. I didn't know that word at that time. She didn't know what to do. <laughs> I went to Ursula, right? A graduate of Ursula, four years of religion classes. Wasn't religious, wasn't Catholic, wasn't against Catholic. I was just like, by that time I'd gone through the university with multiple degrees, and especially in philosophy, political science, and I was anything but religious. But when the Lord hit me and that time came, it was early on, and I didn't know what to do. And I, I went to the diocese. <laughs> I said, hi, I, I went to earth. I said, oh, come in, son. Sat down and it was a wonderful nun. She talking to me, I tell her what was happening to me and she's going, what? What's going on with you? What? Oh man, you need to get back into mass. I said, well, I, I don't know. 
And, and I said, I, I need somebody to anoint me. She had me talk to the priest. Had to get an appointment. I'm waiting to get anointed, right? I'm like dying. I'm like a dog lapping water. I need to be anointed like today. I had to wait till Monday to talk to the priest. Wonderful guy. Wonderful guy. Sat down with him and he said, son, you've experienced what you tell me are miracles, visitations. Yes, I have. He said, well, we need to write all those down and send them to Rome and wait for them to validate whether they're real miracles or not. I said, really? I said, how long will that take? Oh, I don't know. He said, sometimes it takes a couple years. And I said, no, 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 you don't understand. I need to be anointed now. Can't you anoint me? No, I can't. I said, oh. Finally, my mom stops by with some pastina at my house because I had nothing. And she goes, what's wrong? You look really disturbed. I said, Mom, I need to be anointed. She goes, what are you talking about? I said, the Lord told me I need to be anointed and I need to be anointed now. And it has to do with our people. It has to do with the Jews, to open the eyes of the Jews. And the Lord told me I need to do it now. Oh, she said, she left and she called Uncle Don Miladona, who happened to be going to assemblies out on Cardinal Drive with Louis Fortunato. I had about a quart of gasoline in my car on Selma Avenue on the north side. I was willing to walk. And my mom said, Dom said tomorrow at noon to meet him and there's a pastor there, Louis Fortunato at the church, they will anoint you. I couldn't sleep all night. All night, I'm praying, Lord, open the eyes of my people. Open their ears. Let me be a Gael unto my people, Lord, as you were to me. Help me, Jehovah Gael. Let's rescue, rescue, rescue. I went limping in there at noon. I was there early in the parking lot in case I ran out of gas on the way. They came. They brought me up to the altar. They didn't ask me any questions. They said, come here, son. They anointed my eyes, anointed my ears. And then Louis stopped back like this. He goes, oh my. And I don't know if you knew Louis Fortunato. He animated a heart of love. Not the best Bible teacher by all means, but a lover of the Lord. And what he gives is love. His gift is love. And that's what I needed right there. I didn't need anybody else questioning me. I just needed love. His seed was love. God planted that seed in him to love me at that moment. And when he did, the seed inside of me loved. And all of the confusion and the hurt and the condemnation went out because of the seed bringing forth its own kind of love. And Louis stepped back and he went like this. He says, oh my, oh my, Francesco, I see a rose and the rose is coming up out of the fertile ground and it's going so high and it's opening up to bud in its season. And he said, God has planted a giant. I didn't quite get it, but I got enough to know that something was planted and growing for me. And then I understood that prepare the way meant in its season, it will come. And has come. So for me, it's life changing. For me, it's merging with the coating of the seed that God gave me from the beginning of time. But I know it's for you too. You just have to water that seed. You see that thick skin the seed coat it keeps just 
enough moisture in the third part of the seed. Just enough. Which is called the endosperm. Another word for it is the nutrition. In those seeds that were buried in the tomb for a couple thousand years, just inside that softest part was a little bit of moisture, a little bit of nutrients, so that seed didn't lose its kind for all that time. That's what's in you. Just enough. Just enough that it's ready to come alive. All you have to do is come in agreement with the Lord and make a commitment to the time to be in the atmosphere, to allow the Holy Spirit to brood and speak to the innermost part of your heart and your seed and say, come forth. Come forth. It's due season. You're in your time. Come forth. Come forth. I'm going to draw a line here and come back to it. Interesting thing about the endosperm, this big area that is inside. Interesting thing about it. Not only does it make sure that the seed continues its potency and its, its opportunity to forever be presenting itself and multiplying. But it has the food source that activates the emerging seedling when this embryo breaks in and it activates and it activates. And what happens? releases the glory of the seed. The Word of God tells us every celestial body and every living thing has a glory of its own. You have a glory all of your own. And when that nourishment is released from the innermost part of what God has given you, the glory breaks through. And it comes out through the hard part that is there to protect you. And when that glory comes through, you begin to reproduce and multiply. And the fruit that God has made you, the special kind that you are, it begins to bring forth that fruit. And as it brings forth that fruit, the glory of the Lord moves. And he's not satisfied that you have one release. <laughs> he says, let's move now together from glory to glory and from glory to glory. And so we become the perpetuating seed dynamic, which is what I call it now. The perpetuating seed dynamic. You keep planting and the Lord keeps growing. You keep planting. And it's neither you or he that plants or harvests, but the Lord who waters. The Lord brings forth that which is cultivated. Not the one who waters, not the one who plants, but the Lord. But we have to do it with him. If we don't bring the buckets of manure to the plants, they don't grow like they're supposed to. Take it from me. <laughs> but when you do and you're faithful, wow, you get the best. The best. They're juicy. They shine. 
they're healthy. And the next time, they replant themselves. And they come forth. So today, you might be feeling a little stale when you walked in, but I hope you aren't when you're leaving. Answer the call of God. Whatever it is, answer it and be faithful to it. And don't drink out of too many wells, beloved. Some of you are still running around drinking out of wells. You call it service. It's not service. It's confusion. Listen to me. It's confusion. Well, but God made me for this and made me for that and made me for that. Did he? Did he make you for all those things? Jesus said, you'll have the poor with you always. He's saying to some of you, yeah, it's good to take care of the poor, but not if you're neglecting what I've given you to do. And don't measure it by quantities. And by all means, don't measure it by the affirmation of people. People will make you feel good to do the things they want you to do. <laughs> I hit some buttons, didn't I? Oh, I get a lot of attaboys. Until the rubber hits the road and the fire's up the tail. All of a sudden, I'm the only boy. I am the boy. You see, don't let affirmation decide who you are and what you do. Don't, don't do that. And don't fill holes in for people that you're not called into. I've been there and done that. But, that, but they need me, really? They really need you? Is it taking you away from what God gave you and how God gave you and the people God gave you? No, they need something. Maybe they need not to do what they're doing or maybe they need to find somebody of the like kind. We must be pure to what God gives us if you want your seed to be pure. Remember, the embryo of the seed draws from the soil that you're planting in. It draws from it. Be careful what you draw from. That's why I've told you all, and I'll tell you all the time, don't list, just let anybody lay hands on you because that seed will impart something to your seed. And here's something about that. Spirit doesn't always separate what's good in a seed and what's bad in a seed. It imparts the whole seed. Young pastor up in Michigan. Church was behind him. He was on fire. They had a good run. The church was growing. It was its second year. It was its third year. And then one of the older people, mature person, who was still there from before that guy and was there, he goes, something's wrong. He said, I smell smoke on a lot of people in this church when I walk in. <laughs> you know, the more you don't smoke, the more smoke bothers you, right? <laughs> he, says, I, he says, I. he says, first I smelled it over here, then I smelled it over there, then I smelled it. He said, I smell it all around. What's going on in this church? So he and one of the ladies, they went to the pastor and said, Pastor, we're smelling smoke in the church. And then all of a sudden, they smelled smoke on him. And every Sunday, he'd lay his hands on the people at the altar. Pretty soon, a lot of the church was smoking just like him. Be careful what you allow to be imparted to you. Be very careful. Protect yourself. Let that deep coat, that seed coat, trust it. Draw from the white waters. And the Holy Spirit inside of you, that's why we call deep calls to deep. Because the Spirit of God is searching deep into the things of you and manifesting them and bringing them forth. We will never be, I promise you this as long as I'm part of it, we will never be a traditional Bible university. Can't happen. I'm too weird. It's not gonna happen. But what we give and what we bring is dealing deep in the seed to come out. And we're not too proud 
to say, we maybe didn't get that quite right. Let's make it better. Because the Spirit of God is, is always changing and rearranging and bringing stuff fresh. That's, that's why our whole theme, and for years, it's building on that firm foundation of the Word of God because that is the foundation, but with fresh revelation. Because as the seeds activate, God gives us revelation. And we love to say old things have passed away, and all things are new, but a lot of us don't want to let the old things go because it challenges us. And maybe it takes us outside of our comfort level, or maybe somebody tells you, your pastor's too weird for me. I take that as a compliment. I'm a strange bird, aren't I? And I know you hear that stuff. I, my ears are closed to it. I don't care anymore. I've been called everything you could be called. I've been written up in magazines and papers and news reporters, and they're trying to draw me out right now, and I'm not biting until the Lord gives me the word. And when I do, it probably won't be one they like. Respect yourself. Respect your God. Respect your kind. Ask the Lord to begin to show you the patterns of the seed inside of you. If the code's good, but it's got an addition of some flesh to it, just like a goat, get rid of it. Ask the Lord to cut it out and quit drinking from those waters and from those people. You'll find out that that where you're trying to get, you'll get there much faster when you're not spreading yourself out all over the place to be something to people that you're not supposed to be. Myself, I get a lot of invitations, a lot of opportunities. I very rarely accept one because I want to know why. Why do you want me to come? What do you expect from me? A lot of times I don't even have to ask the question. I already know and I'm not buying. I'm not going just to have a healing service. And I'm not mitigating that. That's a wonderful thing. But I can't just do that. That comes with it. I'm here to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. That's all I care about. And it's kingdom. If it's kingdom, I'm in. If it's not kingdom, I'm out. It should be the same for you. And if it's somebody else's kingdom you're helping build, get out. Because it's not about their kingdom. Let every kind bring forth its own kind. And let me tell you, from the top to the bottom, ministries are getting shaken all over this earth right now. I know. I know who they are. I fellowship with them. I communicate with them. Not on Facebook. You don't get truth on Facebook. Come on. Those are your friends, right? Yeah, but if I have 100,000 of them, I'm going to get some money. Oh, really? Wow. That, what if you spent that same time doing something else instead of Facebook all the time? You think you might make some money? I know people addicted to Facebook. My Lord Jesus, I don't know how they get the time. Putting a picture of everything they do every two minutes. Come on. Who cares? You care. It's feeding an ego. Feed the Lord. If you're going to put something out there, make sure it's the thing you want because you're watering everything else you're doing when you put too much out there. You start putting on the Facebook someone who's given a message halfway around the world. Why? Is that the message? What's your message? What about that time? Is it productive? Oh, it might get you some more friends and get you some more moolah. God will find you when the right time comes. I didn't intend to get into all that, but I did. And if you don't like it, throw stones at me. I don't care. Just so you all know, I know I have a Facebook. She'll tell you. I don't even know how to get on it. Dwayne will tell you. They put stuff on it. People message me on it. I don't know they did, and they're not going to get an answer. It comes up on my phone. I don't even know what to do with it when it comes up on my phone. I just delete it. Delete, 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 delete. Now there's 
Big X's come up on my phone. I delete those. I don't know what those do either. Thank God I never had a TikTok on my phone. It's a convenient tool, but it's not your ministry. It's not who you are. It's not who you are. So, we're going to draw a line there. Next week, I want to talk about germination of a seed. You're going to be really excited, I think, about how that happens. And I want to talk about first fruits. I'll give you a little hint about first fruits. We know Jesus was the first fruit, but we also know we're told that we're the first fruits. And the good news about the perpetuating seed is that you're not a first fruit one time. You're a first fruit every time unless you're not a first fruit. Hmm? And the first fruits are the ones that please God. He wants you to give the first fruits. So let's learn how to be first fruits of our seed, of our callings, and of who we are. Amen? Now I know this different message, isn't it? What else do you want? It's truth. And when we understand the mystery of the seed, the spiritual mystery, and how it correlates with the physical, science of the seed. Now we understand that Jesus wasn't just throwing stuff out there when he gave us the parable of the seeds. He was inviting us to have this conversation this morning. Think about that. That awes me. I almost didn't sleep all night because I was dwelling on the seed. Something about the darkness and quietness of a bedroom, you dwell on the seed. And I said, Lord, there's so little I know about that. But now you've provoked me. I want to know more and more and more. I want to know about the seed in me. I want to know about the seed in others. I want to know how you activate seed in me and how I can help activate seed in others. I want to know how we can become part of the anointing of the movement of God in the kingdom right now, just like it has been in the past and shall be and always shall be with your Holy Spirit brooding. Lord, I want all of that. I want all of that.